This week, we explain what to do about stale gas when your car sits without being driven. We share our road test results from the updated 2020 Volkswagen Passat, and we answer your questions about hybrids, Jeeps, and car seats. Next on Talking Cars. Hey, welcome back. Uh, I'm Keith Barry. I'm Emily Thomas. And I'm Mike Monticello. And we're here for another uh, remote episode of Talking Cars. And this is our 250th episode. Uh, and glad to be here, glad to be able to talk about cars. Uh, the news this week uh, that is automotive related is that road travel is down. Uh, in fact, the, the firm Enrix, which tracks that sort of thing, shows that road travel is down about 38% week over week. And if you've been out on the roads, I'm sure both of you have probably noticed that. Uh, noticed as well that there there aren't that many people out there. But that means if people aren't using their cars, if they're doing the right thing, they're sheltering in place, they're not driving, um, which they should be doing, they should not be driving, uh, what happens to gas? Uh, what happens to the gas that's in the car? And we've had a couple of questions about this. So Mike from St. Louis asked, I bought a Chrysler Pacifica plug-in uh, a few months ago. In that time, I've only used a half gallon of gas. Should I be putting some sort of additive in the tank? And Sam asks, in light of the COVID-19 crisis we're dealing with, I was wondering how long gas can last in a tank. I know gas in a separate gas can has a three-month or so limit. Does that apply to a car's gas tank, especially if you aren't driving that often? So, Monty, I know you've covered this on ConsumerReports.org. Um, what what do you have to say? Yeah. So, yeah, the reality is gas does degrade over time. It will go stale. Um, and think of it, if you're already someone who doesn't drive, you know, put a lot of miles on your car on a regular basis, and now you're either even driving even less, or maybe you've just decided to not drive at all. Maybe you haven't left the house in, in a month or something like that. Um, so if your gas was already kind of old, it, you know, if you hadn't filled it up in a, a good month or so, and now you're going to go maybe another month or two months without um, either driving much or, or having the need to put in any new gas. Yeah, absolutely. Two months uh, with the same gas, you're probably fine. But once you start getting to three months or more, uh, now the gas is going to start to degrade. And that that can be a problem. And people do need to be aware of that, either putting new gas in or some other uh, some other additives. Interesting. Emily, what, what is happening in that gas tank? What's the, what's the science that's going on there? So our chief mechanic, John Ibbotson, says that the reason that the gas goes bad is because the lighter, more volatile components of gasoline tend to evaporate over time, which obviously is going to change the composition of your gas, right? And it's causing the gas to break down. It can... Um, give this like varnish type of smell to your gas. We don't recommend anyway going and trying to smell <laughs> no. or sniff there. We're bored, but definitely not. Definitely not yeah. But <laughs> not, not yeah. on a regular basis anyway. Exactly. If like you open your gas cap and you get like, right. a whiff of that, mm. that's one thing, right? Exactly. Or, you know, it'll have sort of, it'll start to develop like this gumminess, like a gunk kind of to the gas quality. Um, and things that contribute to that are, you know, as Monty was just saying, if you don't have a full tank of gas right now in your in your gas tank there's going to be this extra space or this air that's there and that can um that extra room in the tank can allow for condensation to occur and that condensation that moisture um contributes to the gas breaking down it changes like the, the chemical makeup of the gas um additionally you know your gas tank just naturally on its own already sweats. And so that adds condensation and moisture that compromises the gas. So there are consequences to having stale gas in your tank. Um, on the less severe end, it can be that it's going to affect your performance of the vehicle. It's going to affect um, engine power, causing hesitation or stalling. Worst case scenario, your car isn't going to start, right? Because um, it's affecting the fuel pumps and the fuel injectors. So it is an important thing for us to be thinking about. We're trying to conserve everything in this time, right? And you might not be thinking that, okay, I need to now go out and fill up my my gas tank to make sure I have a full tank of gas because where am I going? I'm trying to conserve energy, conserve fuel, conserve like all of my um, household products. But it is important to know that you really ought to have a full tank if you want to preserve just the longevity of 
the gasoline that you already do have and your vehicle in general, right? So you're not driving your car sitting there. You're doing all the right things. What do you do to keep all those awful things from happening? I mean, Monty, I, I know you wrote about that in, in your article. Uh, there are some tips about that, right? Right, right. Yeah. So as Doc Ems was saying, the, the first thing you can do uh, is fill up your car's fuel tank. And, you know, so there's basically two things and they're both very easy to do. Fill up your car's fuel tank to the top. And luckily, gas is is uh, pretty cheap across most of the country right now, right now, so it's a good time to fill up. And also get uh, something called fuel stabilizer, which is uh, they come in these kind of smallish bottles. You can get them at you know an auto parts store, uh, a hardware store. You can even order uh, a, a, a stabilizer online. And basically, uh, you want to add the fuel stabilizer the same time you fill up the fuel tank. Uh, you actually want to put the stabilizer in first. You want to put it in. Uh, proportional. It's, it says it on the label how to figure out how much to put in, but it has to do with how much uh, fuel you're going to put in as that dictates how much uh, stabilizer you put in. Um, and so you want to do both of those things at the same time. The fuel stabilizer is a way of helping to uh, helping the, the gas in your tank so that it won't degrade over time. I mean, it's not going to do that forever, but it does stave off, uh, you know, the gas going stale or degrading. Um, that one thing I want to say, though, uh, is that if you don't do it right now and you say you didn't you have the same gas in there for three, four or five months or something like that, adding fuel stabilizer, you know, too late in the game, it, it can't reverse uh, the bad chemicals. You know, once the chemicals have started going bad, it can't reverse that. It can stop it from degrading anymore. But if you put in fuel stabilizer six months into, you know, old gas, you're still going to have old gas. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so fuel stabilizer, folks might even have that if they have, you know, small lawn equipment or something, they might even have that in their... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's usually called, uh, there's brands called Stable, there's another one called Seafoam. They're, they're very easy to find. And it's, it's a very simple procedure. Yeah. And as far as filling the tank up is concerned, there are also uh, guides on how to do that safely. So you don't, you know, gas pumps, a lot of people touch them and you want to stay safe. Um, so there are some tips on, on CR.org about that as well. So uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, we're going to get to more questions a bit later, but you know, we, we actually, we've been doing some driving. Uh, we did some driving before this all happened. I actually uh, was with a Volkswagen Passat, the new 2020 Volkswagen Passat for about two and a half weeks. Uh, it, was, it was my primary mode of transportation. Wow. I, t I took it home one night and it was, never it was went back. <laughs> never went back. So I, I've spent a lot of time in, in the 2020 Passat. Before all this happened, we finished testing the 2020 Passat before I took it home for two and a half weeks. Uh, and you can find all of that stuff. Members can find that on uh, CR.org. But, you know, this is talking cars. Let's talk about the car. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is sort of it's not really a, a big update, right? It's just kind of a, a mild refresh of an existing car, relatively affordable sedan. Emily, you spent some time in it, right? Yeah. Unlike you, I didn't <laughs> take it home for multiple weeks at a time. I mostly just spent time with it during the test phase. Um, so for me, since I'm doing car seats, I spent a lot of time in the back seat of the car. <laughs> it's a big back seat. Exactly. That's like literally what I was about to say. I was pretty surprised with how roomy it was back there i expected it to be a little bit more cramped um not just in terms of leg room but just even width wise um one of the things that we noted in our car seat ratings of the vehicle was that you are actually able to fit three car seats across the back seat um so we use like a rear facing infancy we use a forward facing convertible and we use a booster seat we actually could put all three of them across the back um, which is not the case even in some small SUVs. Mm. So I thought that was pretty great, you know, because it's it's kind of the size for, you know, a family car. Um, and it's always helpful that, you know, if you have, if you do have three kids and you need to put them all in car seats, or if you're carpooling and you have an extra kid with you, or, you know, you even want to be able to fit two car seats and then an adult back there, like you can do that feasibly. Yeah. And that's something that even some Volkswagen SUVs can't fit three seats across <laughs> across the the second row, so that's that's pretty big. Monty, you you spent some time driving it. Unlike the time I spent driving, you spent you spent some time on the track. Um, what, how does how does this car handle? What is it? You know, it's supposed to be a little bit maybe a little more sporty than some of the other cars out there. Is that is that right or? 
Well, yeah, typically we expect a German, you know, midsize sedan like what what the Passat is to, uh, you know, have a little bit more of an edge uh, than, you know, some of its competitors. But the handling is actually just kind of average. It's nothing special. You know, actually, I think the steering's a little bit on the light side. It turns in nicely um, and it takes a nice set through corners, but I wouldn't call it, you know, actually sporty or anything like that. But, um, you know, one of the things I you do notice when you're driving is how airy the the outward views are. You know, that's something that has uh, gone away from modern cars for crash safety. You know, they usually have these big pillars. Well, it actually has pretty slim windshield pillars, has nice long side windows, which makes it easier when you're looking over your shoulder, you know, to see if there's any someone in the next lane, has a helpful third kind of triangle window back there. And the biggest thing is that it has relatively slim uh, rearmost pillars. And that's, it's usually the back pillars that get you in a car in terms of like, you think the outward visibility is good. Then you really look toward the rear and you're like, oh my gosh, there's these giant pillars back there. So from that perspective, uh, you know, it, it does really well. Um, but there are some things that I, I really don't like about the car. Yeah, I mean, D- Ems is right that it has a really big rear seat and comfortable front seats, but it has this annoying uh, abruptness. As soon as you tip into the throttle, uh, you know, it kind of like gives you everything at once. And, and that's, that's kind of annoying. And it even, uh, when you're, when you slow down for a turn and then you take your turn and you're getting back on the throttle, sometimes there's a delay, but then as you step more into the throttle, again, does the same thing where it gives you all this power at once. And so those things are just a little bit, you know, a little bit lacks some refinement. The transmission itself shifts very smoothly and is, and is pretty responsive. Um, the ride is on the firm side. I wouldn't say harsh. But, you know, compared to something like a Subaru Legacy, it's not even within the realm of how, you know, cushy a Subaru Legacy is. And then from a personal standpoint, this is something that bothers me, uh, is the center con, the hard plastic center console is very intrusive. It's always bothering my right knee. So, so those are some things. But I mean, again, there's, there's some high points as well about, you know, the interior and controls and things like that. But the, the underpinnings of the car, the engine, the transmission, all of that sort of dates back to the, the previous generation Passat, right? There's nothing, nothing groundbreaking or revolutionary here. No, it's just a nothing, look. nothing groundbreaking. And uh, it's, it's honestly at this point getting to be an outdated platform. And keep in mind, the, the U.S. Passat is different than the European Passat. This is not as sophisticated of a car as the European version. So it's due for a complete redesign. Don't you think, Keith? Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, I've driven the Arteon, I've driven the Legacy, and, uh, you know, the Arteon proves that, that VW can build a better uh, big sedan than, than the Passat. Uh, the Legacy proves that other companies can, can build an, a, a big no-nonsense sedan better than, than, than the Germans can. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and, and it's not like, it, I mean, it doesn't have a great road test score. It doesn't have, you know, a road test score that's way, that p- places it way up at the top. But it still has a high enough overall score uh, that it's still recommended by CR. You know, it's it's still a good car. Yeah, but it kind of goes to that thought that some manufacturers, I think, they're like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? Hang on. But did I just hear Doc M say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? If it ain't? <laughs> you did. You okay. Did. <laughs> PhD, ain't. Okay. Carry on. Please. But that only works if you're at the top of your group like if you're not still competitive with your peers i mean it sounds like you guys are saying it's average it's like middle of the road for the entire test group or not test group but peer group then perhaps it's time to actually start implementing some improvements so that you can be competitive with the rest of your group everyone else is you know uh, raising the bar for what's to be expected for this class then vw might want to think about making some bigger upgrades (laughs) Yeah, yeah, totally and that's agree. also true with uh, with reliability as well. I mean, Volkswagen's never at the top in our reliability ratings, and if you've got cars out there like a Camry, which is which is a delight to drive, uh, that's always at, towards the top there. The Accord. I mean, this is a crowded field. The one thing this car has going for it that the Passat has going for it, I think, is sort of a familiarity. It's it's a little bit old fashioned. Uh, I mean, Monty, you were talking about the visibility. Right. Um, it feels like getting into an older car. The because they haven't changed. Because they haven't changed it in years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everything, the dashboard is laid out. It feels like I'm in a, you know, in a 1970s Audi or something. I mean, it's but very, I like everything that. Is, I, I like, I like it that. Too. Yeah, yeah. I like it too. And I wish that more manufacturers would kind of take, you know, take some of that and just maybe put it in a better car. But the yeah, good news yeah. is that even though it feels old fashioned, 
the transmission's old fashioned, uh, the platform's old fashioned. There is a lot of standard safety equipment, which is an old fashioned, right? Yeah, it comes with standard forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking, pedestrian detection, blind spot warning, um, rear cross traffic warning. So these are all really great systems that are going to help drivers out on the road. And so, you know, in that regard, VW is totally keeping pace because they're putting in the standard safety equipment that's, you know, going to improve the road test score, that's going to um, improve how it benefits their consumers, which is great. And, you know, for that kind of stuff, I'm totally a fan. For more on the Passat, uh, head over to CR.org. You'll see all the numbers, lots of pictures, lots of more information about it. Uh, But next up, it's time for your questions. So we we love getting video questions from you because now you get to see the insides of our houses. We get to see the insides of yours. So keep them coming to TalkingCars at iCloud.com. Our first video question uh, this week, our only video question this week, is from Zach from Philadelphia. Hello, Talking Cars. How you doing? I'm going to be moving from Philadelphia to South Carolina uh, in the beginning of the summer, and I want a fun vehicle for down there. Um, I know Jeep is coming out with um, their plug-in hybrid models. I have decided that I want this Jeep Gladiator Rubicon. My only concern is I um, love the idea of a plug-in hybrid with the added torque and better fuel economy. I don't know, is it worth waiting or do I get this Gladiator now and potentially trade it in two or three years down the road? Is there a concern that when the plug-in hybrid comes out, um, that it's a new powertrain and um, may not be as reliable? Hoping you guys can help address my questions and figure out uh, what to do here. Thank you. Wow, Zach, what a view. I I think I could see, I think I saw Rocky uh, in in the background there, right? (laughs) Yeah, he's looking right over that the Ben Franklin Parkway and the art museum. It's beautiful. Excellent. So Emily, I'll throw it to you because you're, you're from Philly uh, and, and Zach is leaving Philly. And I think you might have some thoughts about that. Yeah. So my advice is pretty much the same advice, but applicable to multiple areas of life. So first non-car related, don't leave Philly. I lived in (laughs) Philly for 10 years. I Call myself a Philly expat. You'll miss it. You'll regret it. Don't do it. Look at that view that you have. It's beautiful. And the food. You'll miss the food so much. And then as far as getting a Jeep, nobody ever listens to me about this. But also, don't do it. Um, (laughs) The reliability is just so bad. (laughs) And also, I just don't find them to be very comfortable cars. Like my brother just went and bought a Jeep after I've told him numerous times not to do it. So, I mean, you can just follow suit and not listen to me because I know it's like a cult thing and you guys are going to love it anyways. Even if like you deep, deep down know that it is kind of terrible, you'll still say you love it. But yeah, I just, I wouldn't go for the gladiator. Just just FYI, Ems, I don't listen to my older sister either. So I can't fault your brother too much for that. (laughs) I'm sorry, Karen. I'm just joking. Don't hate me. (laughs) She's going to beat you up the next time she sees you. Well, this, this, that's a very Philly thing to say. Now, I've got, <laughs> I've got, but, you know, Zach's right about a lot of things that yeah. he said here. Uh, you know, if you think about it, first of all, uh, you know, uh, Jeep has, you know, they haven't officially said that there would be a Gladiator plug-in hybrid. They have officially said there's going to be a Wrangler plug-in hybrid. And of course, we know that the Wrangler and the Gladiator are very, very similar to each other. Uh, the, the Wrangler plug-in hybrid uh, is supposed to be uh, available by the end of this year. They haven't officially unveiled it yet, uh, partially due to um, you know some, some auto show cancellations. Um, but I asked a Jeep spokesman about, you know, okay, so what's going on? So we know there's a Wrangler plug-in hybrid coming. Is, you know, there's, it's so similar. The Gladiator is so similar. Is there going to be a Gladiator? Here's all he would tell me. He would say, um, we expect to offer electrification options across each Jeep nameplate by 2022. But keep in mind, electrification means... Uh, it could mean anything from a 48 volt mild hybrid to a regular hybrid to a plug in hybrid to a battery electric. So we don't really know, but I'd say it's a good guess that there will be uh, a Gladiator plug in hybrid, but probably not till, probably not till, t- you know, 2022. So my advice to you, Zach, is go ahead and buy the Gladiator right now. And because, yes, he's right, as Doc M said, Jeeps, uh, both the Wrangler and Gladiator are, uh, 
below average predicted new car predicted reliability. So so don't even just trade in your Gladiator when the when and if the plug-in version comes out. Actually wait a, a full model year in case there are some bugs with that new uh powertrain. That's that's what I would say. What do you mm. think, Keith? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And also it's a good time to buy a Gladiator. I remember when it first came out, people just, you know, rushed to the dealerships and there were some markups on them and there's some crazy lease deals because people were expecting uh, there to be high residual values. And I think what happened is that basically all that pent up demand was satisfied within like a month yeah. uh, <laughs> because there are some really good incentives uh, even before car sales ground to a halt on Gladiators uh, because, you know, everyone, everyone got one who wanted one and then... Uh, now what? Uh, you know, all those Jeep diehards who don't listen to their older sisters or older brothers or whoever is telling them not to buy one uh, went out and got one. And yeah. Can I, Doc Amps, can I give you one piece of advice? So if you want to feel good, if you want to have a smile on your face when you're driving around out there right now, drive a Wrangler or a Gladiator because suddenly you will notice how many people are driving Wranglers because every Wrangler driver is going to wave to you. I mean, it's just going to happen. It, make, it makes, honestly, it makes you feel good. Oh, the few times I've taken our test car out, people, especially when I was in the Gladiator, like the best part was watching like dudes just like stare me down like on the highway because they were like, wait, they were intrigued by the car and then they saw that it was me driving and they were like, what? Oh my God, why is she in that? I'm just like, hey. Like, no, it's because they recognize you from talking cars. That's why. Oh, yeah, yeah they're, they're fans. I had a, uh -huh. I had a Jeep experience. I was driving to Harry's, the great hamburger place right in Colchester near the track that everyone seems to have heard of. Uh, and I had the Jeep <laughs> and I was driving down one of the streets, back roads, and there was a kid in a Power Wheels Jeep. And I was in the Gladiator and he was in a Power Wheels Jeep and they were the same color and his eyes like bugged out of oh, his head. That's awesome. and, and I was jealous because I never got a Power Wheels when I was growing up. That was... You know, Me neither. So, yeah, so you yeah. were more jealous of him than he was of you. Yeah, but I got the real thing. I don't hold grudges. I don't hold grudges. All right, I think we should move on to the next question. Anyway. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we've got a question from Jim who is asking, why are manufacturers still including tachometers? It takes up so much room in my Forester's instrument cluster, and because of the CVT transmission, really the only control I have over the RPMs is how hard I press the accelerator. Why not use that valuable real estate on something useful? Tax. Why? <laughs> Well, okay. So, I mean, the first thing is if, uh, you know, it's kind of like back in the day, a, a lot of cars didn't have tachometers, right? So what did people do? People like my dad uh, with our 1965 Volvo 544 and our, and our 1968 Volvo 145 wagon, Ooh. He, in, he, yeah, he <laughs> installed a tachometer on top of the dash in each of those cars. So if you don't have a tachometer, a lot of people are going to be like, we want the tachometer. So it, it, it's a situation where manufacturers, you know, it's going to be hard for them to please everyone. But I did reach out to a couple of manufacturers. I reached out to Subaru because, you know, he has a Forester. I just wanted to get their take. I reached out to Toyota because Toyota makes a lot of hybrids, right? And a lot of Toyota's hybrids don't have a tachometer. So I kind of wanted to get their feedback. But before I do that, just... Let's explain what a tachometer is if you don't know. Basically, a tachometer is, is telling you the uh, RPMs or revolutions per minute that the engine is spinning, right? So, you, and, and that's important to know uh, how high those uh, RPMs are, especially, of course, if you're driving a manual transmission. But it's also important with an automatic because uh, the driver might want to know well, why, you know, why is the engine feels like it's hesitating or lugging? You know, if it's down around 1500 RPM, and maybe there's some weird vibration. We've noticed that in a lot, uh, several cars lately that, you know, when they, they try and lug the, lug the engine for good fuel economy, but we have all these weird noises and vibrations. Or maybe the person does have a CVT and it's not a very well-tuned CVT and you're getting on the highway and it's like pinned at 6,000 RPM for 30 seconds as you're trying to accelerate. You know, the, the driver might want to know why, why is the engine making this huge racket, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the first thing, just a little background on that. But so I, when I talked to um, a spokesman from Subaru, he said, he reminded me, which I actually, I was pretty sure. He said, Foresters have the ability uh, with the CVT to manually shift uh, the vehicle, even though it's not a true, you know, gear change uh, because it's, it's a continuously variable transmission. But you do have the ability to, to downshift is the important part for, say, going down a hill. If you want to use some engine braking so you don't have to use the brakes as much. But from that perspective, it's still important to have a tachometer because say you downshift, you know, one 
gear, right? I say gear because it's a CVT. Uh, and the engine and the revs go up a bit and then you want a little more. So you rev, you do another one and revs even higher. Well, you're going to want to know if it's getting, you know, maybe revving too high. You don't want to wind the engine out. Uh, and as far as Toyota, they said that in general, they said there's no hard and fast rule between TAC or no TAC. He said each vehicle chief engineer determines what is most appropriate for the target consumer and vehicle personality. So he said in general, any dedicated hybrid, we don't use a tachometer. Uh, that space is dedicated for other information. Uh, but, you know, a hybrid that has a counterpart that isn't a hybrid, say a Camry and a, and a Camry hybrid, right? One one uses a regular uh, powertrain, the other ha has a hybrid. Uh, the the non-hybrid version will have, or, or I should say that the hybrid version will use the tack location that's in the regular car to show uh, system load and things like that. And the other thing, the one thing is that that I thought was interesting that Toyota spokesman told me was he said all internal combustion engine equipped models will retain a tachometer. I think what he meant was at least for the foreseeable future. So we're not going to be seeing tachometers go away anytime soon. Interesting. In most cars. Now, Monty, that one forty four, it didn't have a tack, but it did have a choke, right? It, it did. Yeah, both cars <laughs> had manual chokes, um, and um, it, it was actually a one forty five. Uh, and, and, you know, the speedometer in the 145 was that red, you remember these Keith, the red arrow that goes yeah. across the, the dash. So you have your, your, your speed, speed, uh, indicators here and this weird red arrow, this plastic red arrow just goes manually goes across the dash. It's so funny. It's we cool. had that we had that car forever, and I always was so embarrassed that we had this, you know, <laughs> ancient car, and everyone else in the town had newer cars, and we had this old Volvo. Of course, both of them were four speed manuals, and and uh, yeah. Anyway, long story. Ah, and now they're now they're both collectors' items, yeah, <laughs> and probably somewhere. still on the road somewhere. <laughs> probably they're our Volvo. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so we got a question from George who says, I love talking cars and find the virtual episodes seem to be increasing the camaraderie of the team. I got to say, it's nice to talk to somebody, uh, somebody who oh, doesn't live in cat? my house. <laughs> oh. Keith, I got to say, I haven't seen your face in a while. It honestly, man, it is really good to see your face. Yeah. It's good to see everyone's face. This is, this is really nice. And, and if we, you want, uh, you want to see, uh, want us to see your face, send a video question to talking cars at iCloud.com. George, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold that against you. Uh, George asks, considering the cost of crude oil is around $25 a barrel and still dropping and all the new cars out there are without current buyers. Do you think the cost of used hybrids will drop this year? I'm considering buying one for my daughter and I want to get the best deal possible. Short answer is that it, it, car buyers have short memories. You know, it's what's happening right now. They're not really planning for the future. So if gas is cheap right now, and I mean, not to speak to the larger economic conditions, which I don't think anyone can predict, uh, but if people have to buy a car, I don't think that fuel economy is 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 on their minds. I mean, I bought a uh, I bought a, a second generation Prius. Uh, right before gas prices spiked for kind of the, the second time uh, in the 2007-2008 period. And gas prices were relatively low, and I got a good deal on it. And as soon as prices went over $3 a gallon again, I was getting letters from the Toyota dealer saying, we'll buy it back for what you paid because they were going to sell it at a markup. I don't think that's going to happen again because there is a, there's, a, there's a decent, uh, you know, there's a lot of hybrids out there, and a lot of them honestly aren't. Aren't, aren't selling that fast now, but demand, I do predict, will go up when gas prices go up. I mean, what, what do you think? Do you think that's, uh, Emily, does that sound reasonable? Yeah, so I think you'd end up with the best of both worlds, essentially, with a used hybrid. I've had the Subaru Crosstrek plug-in hybrid for like the past month while we've been working from home, and I've hardly had to fill up at all. So that's been really great. So I think that's, that's the way to go. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with a hybrid. Whether you know, if you want a hybrid, uh, get a hybrid. Uh, and there are a lot of great yeah, ones no, out there. It's a no lose situation. Yeah. If you if you you know if you buy it now or pretty soon to now, uh, uh, when uh, no one's buying cars, right? Uh, and and you can probably get a good deal pretty like now or within the next month or so. Uh, but if gas prices go up, you win. If gas prices stay down, you still win because you're still saving all kinds of money because you have a fuel efficient car. Yeah, and there's some really good hybrids too that are fun to drive. You can find the list of them at cr.org. 
uh, and find, find the right one for you. So good luck, George. Uh, last question from Hari, who asks, why aren't safety features like load legs more common on rear-facing infant seats in the U.S.? I see Emily sort of sort of, kind of perked up there when we, we, we mentioned that. In my Subaru Outback, I can install the child seat in the middle of the rear seat using seat belts, but without the load leg because of the transmission bump on the floor, or in the outboard seats using the load leg and latch system, which will be safest for my child. Uh, Emily, this is, this is awesome. Let's, uh, I'm so pumped. <laughs> Nobody great. ever like asked about this stuff. <laughs> so she's geek. She's geeking out. This is I awesome. totally am. <laughs> there was a Philly question and then there's a load light question. This is like my favorite episode ever. <laughs> okay, um, but I was born in Philadelphia. I have more claim to Philly than you do. You just were there for a few years going to school. But Monty, you're a Patriots fan. 10 years. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. exactly. Like don't continue. Even talk to me. Whatever. Continue. Um, so I'm just going to first explain what Hari is talking about, right? What a load leg is. Um, so basically it's a support leg that extends off of the front end of your car seat base and goes from the car seat base to the vehicle floor. The purpose of it is to um, provide extra stability. It better integrates the car seat to the vehicle in the event of a crash and really reduces the forward motion of a car seat. And in doing so, that leg absorbs crash energy during the event, and it reduces the transfer of crash energy to the child occupant in the car seat. Um, we don't see this as much in the U.S. market as we do see it in the European market. In, in Europe, you'll find um, load legs on infant seats. You'll find them on convertible seats, seats that are rear-facing and forward-facing. Here in the U.S., it's primarily on infant car seats. Um, there is one convertible car seat that just got released by Cybex. It's the Serona S that is um, a convertible with a load leg. And it's the first one in, in the US. Um, and I think part of it is because these are features that have been in play a lot longer over in Europe uh, as part of you know meeting their regulations. Um, it really helps in reducing their injury numbers, but it's taking a little bit more time for the American public to understand the benefit of these safety features and you know why they should have them, why, should they, why they should buy them. But we just recently um, updated our infant car seat ratings, and we have 11 models in the car seat ratings right now that have a load leg. And what I can tell you is that in our own crash testing, right, we actually test with the load leg deployed. So it is extended out to the vehicle or to our sled floor um, in our testing. And we do a test condition where we install with the lower anchors or latch, as Harry is saying, or we do it with... Um, the load leg and the three point seat belt, like your lap and shoulder belt. And in comparing between those two test conditions, we see um, a, a benefit of using the um, lower anchors uh, compared to the three point belt. Um, you just see a reduction in the injury numbers for sure, because it's just a better integration to the vehicle seat, like we were talking about before. So, better integration means better energy absorption. Um, in general, when we compared our seats that have a load leg versus the seats that don't have a load leg in the ratings, and we looked at the average head injury risk, there was about a 46% reduction in head injury risk when you use a load leg, regardless of whether or not you were using with the three-point belt or the, um, the lower anchors. So wow. for his particular situation, if he was to install in that center seat, he can't use the load leg, so that's already not going to be as good for his injury numbers, and you're using it with a three-point belt. But in the outboard seating position, he can use a load leg and use lower anchors, which is like the best combination, really integrates that seat in, and he's going to have the the best potential for, for crash protection for his kid. So I would totally say put in that outboard seating position. That's awesome. That's a that's a definitive answer to a, to a really yeah, important yeah, well. question. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. So unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. I, I hope that uh, this is able to give you, a, give you a little break from everything else that's going on. And uh, if you want to read the show notes, learn anything else, see any links to what we've been talking about, including uh, those car seat ratings, the cars that we talked about, uh, anything about stale gas, uh, head over to consumerreports.org. Thanks for talking cars with us, and we'll see you soon. 